Good afternoon and welcome. I am Michael Kessler, Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and a professor in the Government Department and the Law Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's keynote conversation with acclaimed author Karen Armstrong and President John J. DeJoya. As we reflect on last evening's Berkeley Center lecture by Secretary of State Albright and absorb the continual stream of news from around the world, these conversations are ever more critical. The work of the Berkeley Center amidst the scholarly community of Georgetown University is to explore the role of religion within global challenges of democracy and human rights, economic and social development, international diplomacy, and interreligious understanding. We do this work in the firm conviction that a deep examination of faith and values is critical to address these challenges, and that open engagement of religious and cultural traditions with one another can promote peace. Our keynote keynote conversation could not be more timely. Our panelists are extraordinary thinkers to take up these themes. President John J. DeJoya leads our university with a vision that academic institutions, and particularly our Jesuit, Catholic, liberal arts, global research institution, has a special imperative to lead dialogue and inquiry into religion and world affairs. For over three decades, President DeJoya has helped to define and strengthen Georgetown University as a premier institution for education and research. A Georgetown alumnus, Dr. DeJoya, served as a senior administrator and as a faculty member in the Department of Philosophy before becoming Georgetown's 48th president in 2001. As president, Dr. DeJoya is dedicated to deepening Georgetown's tradition of academic excellence, its commitment to Catholic and Jesuit identity, its engagement with the Washington, D.C. community, and its global mission. Under his leadership, Georgetown has become a a leader in shaping the future landscape of higher education and is closing out a very large fundraising campaign dedicated to enhancing the lifelong value of a Georgetown education. We are deeply indebted to President DeJoya for his visionary leadership in seeing the need for and creating the Berkeley Center as a leading university space to foster understanding about religion and its role in world affairs. Joining President DeJoya is in conversation is Karen Armstrong. Armstrong is the author of numerous cutting-edge books on religious affairs, including A History of God, Holy War, The Great Transformation, and her recent book, Fields of Blood, Religion and the History of Violence. She has also authored two memoirs, Through the Narrow Gate and The Spiral Staircase. Her work has been translated into 45 languages. In 1976, Armstrong took a job as t at teaching English at St. James Girls School in Dulwich while working on a memoir of her, pre her previous cover convent experiences. This was published in 1982 as Through the Narrow Gate to Excellent Reviews. That year she embarked on a new career as an independent writer and broadcasting presenter. In 1984, the British Channel 4 commissioned her to write and present a TV documentary on the life of St. Paul called The First Christian, a project that involved traveling to the Holy Land to retrace the steps of the saint. Armstrong described this visit as, quote, a breakthrough experience that defined Defined her pre prior, defied her prior assumptions and was the inspiration for virtually all of her subsequent work. In 1993, she published the groundbreaking book, A History of God, The 4,000-Year Quest of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in which she traced the evolution of the three major monotheistic traditions from their beginnings in the Middle East up to the present day, and also discussing the influence of Hinduism and Buddhism. She has made considerable appearances on television, including the program The Life of Muhammad. She was an advisor for the award-winning PBS documentary Muhammad, Legacy of a Prophet. She has, made, she has written numerous articles for The Guardian and other publications. She's a key advisor on Bill Moyer's popular PBS series on religion, has addressed members of Congress, and it was one of the three scholars to speak at the UN's first ever session on religion. In 2008, Armstrong won the TED Prize her wish for the organization was to help her assemble the, assemble the Charter of Compassion, a document around which religious leaders can work together for peace. In the late fall of 2008, the first draft of the document was written by many around the world via a sharing website. And in 2009, these words were collected and given to the Council of Conscience, a gathering of religious leaders and thinkers who crafted the final document. The Charter of Compassion was launched in November 2009. 
Armstrong maintains a deep critical appreciation for the role of religions as peaceful and compassionate forces for good while recognizing the deeply contradictory ways religion has been deployed over the centuries. As she wrote in Fields of Blood, quote, we have seen that like the weather, religion does lots of different things. To claim that it has a single unchanging and inherently violent essence is not accurate. Identical religious beliefs and practices have inspired diametrically opposed courses of action. She insists, quote, we urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our polarized world. Rooted in pr a principled determination to transcend selfishness, compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological, and religious boundaries. These are fitting words to describe our common work. We are delighted to welcome you back to Georgetown on this 10th anniversary celebration of the Berkeley Center. President DeJoya. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. A beautiful introduction. And it is a great honor to be able to spend this time together. It was a little over a decade ago that we had the privilege to welcome you here to the university in a very special ceremony to present an honorary degree. And that was a, one of the great moments for our community, and it's great to have you back. It's wonderful to be back. I've had such happy times at Georgetown, and that honorary degree meant a great deal to me, especially coming from a Catholic organization, <laughs> uh, as I'm not always beloved by Catholics in my own country. Uh, so it, it, it's always been, a, it's a great pleasure to be here, and congratulations on the Berkeley Center, which is such, doing such important work. Thank you. Thank you. There's so many things we could talk about. Let's start with the most recent book. And Fields of, Fields of Blood has a profound resonance with the ethos of the Berkeley Center, with the idea that our religious traditions can be resources for us as we try to wrestle with the forces of modernity, post-modernity, the kind of challenges that are defining this moment in our world today. And as, as you work that through, the argument in the book, the notion that the received wisdom in contemporary public discourse, that religion is inherently violent, is one that you, you went directly at addressing. So tell us a little bit about the, the argument, and also, well, let's start there. Tell us about how, how you... Well, for years I thought, uh, especially in my uh, earlier uh, books, I thought religion did have a sort of inherent um, uh, violence, but then... Um, then I began to read about how peculiar our notion of religion is in the modern West. Um, it's now central to our secular consciousness that we see religion as a sort of a private quest uh, that uh, is separate from other activities. Um, and uh, but something that should be excluded rigorously from public life. It was part of our modernization, part of our enlightenment, and we're so used to it now that we're, it's very strange to hear for people to, that uh, no other culture has anything like it. And it would have seemed very strange to most Europeans until the years about 1700. Um, because bef the words that we usually translate religion have a much wider frame of reference. Deen in Arabic means a whole way of life. Dharma, too. Um, and um, you, uh, it, the Oxford Classical Dictionary says quite firmly that no word in either Greek or Latin corresponds to the English religion or religious. Religion permeated all aspects of life because we're meaning-seeking creatures. Uh, where dogs, as far as we know, don't spend a great deal of time agonizing about the canine condition or the plight of dogs in other parts of the world. We do, and we fall very easily into despair if we can't find some significance in our lives. So we, we, religion permeated so try all aspects of life, and that would have included warfare and statecraft. And the prophets of Israel had very little time for people who said their prayers nicely in the temple, but neglected the plight of the poor and the oppressed. Jesus, a very political figure. Uh, the, uh, the, the prophet, uh, peace be upon him, um, the, the whole message of the Quran is, is, is about equality, building the jihad, the struggle to build a decent society where people of all ethnicities and persuasions can live together in peace and harmony and respect and to share your wealth equally. That's the bedrock message of the Quran, not warfare. Or, or, or. 
So uh, trying to take politics and religion uh, apart would have been like trying to take the gin out of the cocktail. Um, so thoroughly were the two imbued with one another. Um, and then you start looking through, even the Crusades, for example, we think of them as the quintessential holy wars. Uh, and certainly, uh, religious passions were involved. Uh, but so was politics. The Pope's aim was to uh, make an impression on the Eastern Orthodox Church by going into the East. He was also using the Crusade as uh, an attempt to usurp the king's right to summon people. Europe to arms. Um, and as the Crusades went on, uh, it, the political impact of a crusade at home uh, actually seemed to matter more to the crusading leaders than what actually happened in the Holy Land. And what's fascinating about, uh, about the, the story of the Crusades is the jihad. Um, You'd think that after the first crusaders descended upon Jerusalem, the third holiest city in the Muslim world, and slaughtered the entire population, so that five months later they still hadn't managed to bury all the bodies. Um, you'd think that after that atrocity, 9-11 uh, would be a little pinprick. The whole Muslim world would have descended upon uh, the crusaders in wrath. Not a bit of it. Um, for 50 years, uh, the uh, Crusaders who set up their little states in, in the Near East, our first Western colonies, uh, lived alongside the other Muslim emirs who went on fighting one another for booty and territory as usual. And um, when it, it took finally Salah Hadin and Nur ad-Din 30 years uh, to build up the spirit of jihad. The jihad spirit had been dead, and it was revived by a, uh, a prolonged assault of crusades from the West. Um, and similarly, the wars of religion, that were, they're always cited, and they were at the basis of our separation of church and state. It was thought that uh, the Europeans had been driven mad by the theological quarrels of the Reformation, and so they slaughtered one another in truly terrible wars. Uh, but if it had been only about religion, you wouldn't have expected to find Catholics and Protestants fighting on the same side. But in fact, they often did so, and in the process, killed and fought their co-religionists. This was also a, a, a competition between two different kinds of state uh, holders. One, the, the emperor who wanted to create a European-wide empire, on the, like the Ottomans, um, and the princes who wanted uh, to build up strong separate sovereign monarchies on the model of France and England. How were you able to uh, penetrate the, this the more received wisdom that it was more about religion than it was about the state and expand the horizon under which you interpret those experiences? Why has it been so difficult? Because it, it's still part of the rhetoric today. It is. Uh, partly, I think this is part of the way secularism was developed uh, was on the myth of religious violence. People like John Locke felt that, uh, it, that religion and Hobbes, they all thought that it was religious passions that had been responsible for the, for, for the war. Um, also, um, you know, it's quite easy, especially in a country like Britain, which has very little time for religion, uh, to uh, sort of offload the whole thing, that these people are just crazy and mad and religion is bad. Uh, and it, does, it doesn't look at the, I mean, we have to look at the political element, which is, all, which is always imbued in warfare. Terror, terrorism is always political. Uh, no matter what the ideology, it's about changing power or challenging power or trying to persuade uh, a government or to abandon a, a, or adopt a certain policy. Um, and historians of warfare tell us we always go to war for multiple reasons, one of the chief of which has always been economic. And yet, uh, we, uh, we're not obliged sufficiently to look at our own part in the mess uh, that we have created. And I speak as a British person, and I think of our empire, 
And we, we mentioned compassion and the golden rule. Compassion isn't about feeling warm, tender emotion for people. It's about the golden rule. Never, as Confucius said, do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. Now, I think if we British had not had uh, behaved in, more in accordance with that policy, we wouldn't be having so many political problems today. When I went to Israel for the first time, knowing very little about the conflict in 1982, um, the one thing I found in conversation that the Israelis and Palestinians had in common was how awful the British had been. <laughs> um, and I, it, I, I became aware this is not the Middle East problem, it's our problem too. And, uh, and you look at, um, I, I, I've been very exercised by and distressed, of course, by the uh, violence in France last year, Paris, but also profoundly uncomfortable. Um, you, the, because the whole uh, media spotlight was on the magazine. Charlie Hebdo. And uh, it was a clash of sacred values because freedom of speech is a, is a sacred value for us in the West. Uh, it's something that, you know, a sacred doesn't necessarily mean something that's supernatural, but something so non-negotiable and so central to our I very identity that, it, we, that, that you'd even die for it. Um, and so here that you've got this, uh, these Al-Qaeda people saying, uh, you attack our sacred symbol, the, uh, the prophet, uh, we'll attack yours. Uh, but uh, the whole thing was about freedom of speech. No one mentioned much the supermarket, uh, which even though the hijacker specifically said that he was acting on behalf of the Palestinians, there were, in which the West is implicated in all kinds of ways. Uh, but I was, the worst thing for me was that march um, with all these leaders, some of them rather dubious leaders for upholding freedoms and uh, right. human rights, uh, fight w w marching so proudly and self-righteously for freedom. When many of those, them, including my own prime minister, led countries that had for decades supported uh, regimes in Muslim-majority countries that had allowed their people no freedom of expression and, uh, this, and, and continue to do so. Mubarak, uh, the Shahs, Saudis. Um, so we're not looking sufficiently clearly and we, do, we are only mourning our own dead. Um, we mentioned this morning the 145 Pakistanis killed by the Taliban just a few weeks before that. Me, there was a certain amount of media information. And then there was Boko Haram at about the same time where 2,000 Nigerian villagers had been, were slaughtered. Tiny little mention in the press compared with this Paris bonanza. Um, and just before the last thing, uh, 44 people had been killed in Beirut. And um, the, uh, just two days earlier, and we never mentioned them. And the Lebanese were saying, clearly, we don't matter. Uh, we're giving a distinct impression that some lives are more valuable than others. And so um, we need to, to, I'd like us to see us, you see, every time there is an atrocity uh, say, say the one in, in Pakistan, for us to take flowers, as we tend to do that in England, I don't know if you do it here when there's been a murder or so you take flowers and put, put it outside the, 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 the deceased person's house, we should, have all, we should all be going to the Pakistani High Commission in London and laying, the, uh, laying flowers there, for mourning other people's dead uh, as well as our own. Uh, and, and the fact that we're not doing this troubles me a great deal. And it is during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, by far the more people, who, most people who were killed were civilians who were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, but we never mentioned them. And uh, when I was just after the last Paris assault, I was in Jordan and I was talking to 
a, a closed group of um, uh, diplomats, uh, members of the royal family, politicians, and these were not hotheads. Uh, a gentleman who had been the foreign minister who'd brokered the peace treaty with Israel said, the West has lost its humanity. You don't care about us. It's only your own dead you mourn. And it's very hard to answer that. So, as, as, and, and, so I think one of the things we, we were talking yes this morning, how do we move things forward? I think instead of spending ages chatting, talking about dialogue and what we all have in common and what we don't, this, these kind of simple acknowledgement that at the front piece of my book, I've got the Cain and Abel story. When uh, after Cain has killed his brother, God says to him, uh, Cain, where is your brother, Abel? And Cain says, I don't know. Am I the guardian of my brother? And God says, what have you done? Hark, your brother's blood is crying to me from, from the soil. And we have to remember that these people are our brothers and sisters. And their blood is crying to us from, from the soil. You, you mentioned um, a moment ago um, religion as a scapegoat. Mm. And I think embedded in, in your new book is this, this effort to try to both understand the nature of religion in a more in, uh, incisive way, mm. and at the same time understand the nature of the state. Yes. And I think one of the most powerful lines that I, at its heart, and it's an institution committed to treachery and violence. Yes. Would you take, take us through your... your... Well, um, I, the, the germ of this book began when I was trying to write another book entirely. Um, and it didn't kind of come off. Uh, but this stuck with me. I was reading about pre -modern, the pre-modern empires uh, based on a surplus of ag agricultural produce. And every single one of them Every single one of them depended um, upon a, a surplus of agricultural produce, and it depended upon uh, subjugating 90% of the population who were reduced to serfdom. Uh, their surplus was taken from them. And, this, and historians tell us that without this iniquitous system, uh, we would not have probably have progressed as a species because it created a leisured, privileged class with the leisure to explore the arts and sciences on which our progress depended. One of these being religion. Many of the uh, great religious leaders were aristocrats. Uh, they had the ch they, you, uh, peasants would not have been allowed to sit for hours doing yoga in the fields. Uh, they, the overseers would have had much to say. So, but this is institutional violence. Uh, it's structural violence, and that uh, was what the prophets were crying out against, what Jesus was, what Muhammad was. It, all, it, but, and there were always voices crying out for this, and yet no one found another solution. And warfare was essential to the economy. Uh, because the only way you could increase your gross national product was to get more agricultural land and more peasants to farm it. And the people who suffered most were, of course, the peasants on, on the ground who just between the armies. And booty was an important source of warfare. And therefore, warfare got sacralized, too, because uh, like every other activity. It, so that, is, that, is, that was, I suddenly thought, no one's talked about this. It's all about crusades being, or, or, or holy wars and inquisitions, not seeing that the, by far the biggest uh, diskiller of civilians, destroyer of civilians, cruelty to civilians has always been the state. And so it's been little better, really, in our industrial civilization because you, Charles Dickens wrote very early uh, about, the, uh, about the new industrial city, uh, the hands, he calls them, giving them only instrumental uh, value. About, uh, and and, uh, and we've, but still, the inequity exists between rich and poor, however much we, we, we try, and, uh, or we don't always try very hard. And we, it seems to me we've created a new aristocracy 
It's now the West and the rest. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and still, warfare, of course, with our te technology, has killed more people, as we know, than ever before, yeah. including civilians. So, uh, the, the, you know, the state uh, is responsible for far more deaths, uh, of civilian deaths, innocent people's deaths, than religion ever, ever has been. Yeah. Um, in addition to your writing, over the last oh, decade or so, you've participated in two very significant acts of public engagement. You were part of the UN Alliance for Civilization, and then as, as Michael mentioned in his opening comments, you, you helped put together the Charter for Compassion. Can you talk about those two projects and how they connect to, to the work that you've been engaged in in your writing? Well, we were, we were asked by Kofi Annan um, to uh, diagnose the causes of extremism. And we came from all over the world and sat around a table. Uh, John Esposito was, was one of the, well, one of the people from here, was one of the, uh, one of us, Desmond Tutu, uh, President Hatami. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we, came, we came out finally with this, with a document. Um, and we, what we said was that really, unless there was an equitable solution to the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, equitable to both, all sides, uh, whatever else we suggested uh, in terms of immigration policy, uh, education, youth opportunities, would not work. But it had to be equitable. Yeah. Um, and the UN's done all sorts of things with youth, and, yeah. but it, this it, it didn't touch. If, if you were to come together today, do you think the alliance would have come up with the same recommendation, or would, would it have expanded beyond? Well, it had happened after 9-11, of course. Uh, so uh, they're, they're, we were very preoccupied with that. But you, you see, it's, I think it, it's symbolic. Uh, it, it's symbolic for all sides. Uh, and once something is symbolic, it becomes more than itself. Um, for Jews, Israel is like the phoenix rising from the ashes of Auschwitz. It's, it's something, some way of making meaning for something absolutely appalling. Uh, for uh, Palestinians uh, and for the Muslim world too, it has become a symbol of Muslim impotence in the world. And we have to remember that Islam was a great, great world power, similar to the United States, until we, British and French, went in and reduced them overnight to a, a, a subordinate bloc. Um, and so, uh, and, and we in the West have, have, in Europe, of course, we're highly conscious of the Holocaust. Um, and I, what got me into all this, I this only fell into it by accident, uh, I never intended to do any of this, was at the time of the Rushdie crisis. Um, I was, of course, appalled by that fatwa, uh, which actually offended against basically Iranian Shiite principles as well as our free speech. But I was also appalled by the speed and facility with which British intellectuals uh, segued from a denunciation of the fatwa to an out-and-out -out denunciation of Islam as a, an evil, uh, bloodthirsty religion. And those were the words being used. And I thought, I felt a sense of great dread because uh, it was that kind of talk which had enabled Hitler to do what he did in, and because he had prepared uh, with, a, with a campaign uh, of, 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 and building on a long tradition of anti-Semitism in Europe. And I thought, well, this is going to happen again. We, we're like alcoholics in Europe. We can't afford another sip of this noxious liquor. And by the end of that decade, the 90s, there were concentration camps again on the outskirts of Europe, but this time with Muslims in them. And so these, uh, Israel-Palestine can get sort of uh, attracts all kinds of guilt. And for the United States, I think, sees almost Israel as the alter ego, its alter ego in the Middle East. It, too, 
uh, was formed from refugees from intolerant Europe. Um, and, um, and, and has that, and, and there's also the question of the Native Americans. Um, so that these, it, it's all very complex. It's not just a question of just the dispute and who's, who's right, who's wrong. These, these go back into our past, into the psyche in, 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 a, in a big way. Got it. So tell us how you got into this charter, oh, well, charter business. Well, you see, I, 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 the TED Prize, I, I'd never heard of TED, actually. And so I was rather surprised. I, TED, who's he? <laughs> Sid, Bill, you know, I mean, anyway, uh, they give you a, a wish for a better world, which, te which TED uh, says they'll fulfill. Now, um, I knew almost immediately what I wanted because I was getting sick and tired of religious leaders coming together and going on about homosexuality or something. There was one appalling program on the BBC where a whole lot of uh, bishops from the Anglican Church worldwide gathered in Africa in some place. And the way they were speaking, not just about homosexuals, about one another, was absolutely appalling. And I... Uh, and, so, uh, or doctrine, you know, they, 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 they come out with some sort of doctrinal statement which everybody has to believe in. But every single, uh, my, my studies, whatever I've been writing about, whether it's been a history of God or a history of fundamentalism or a history of Jerusalem, uh, it kept pushing me back to compassion, the material. Now, I had not experienced compassion, religion as a compassionate uh, in, 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 my, in my youth, as in my nun days. Uh, but um, I, I, this was convincing to me that th th this told us something very important about the structure of our humanity, that every single tradition has evolved its own uh, version of the golden rule. And it seems to me, seemed to me absolutely imperative that a now it's not just a nice idea and it's not just kumbaya. Uh, it's a, a glo urgent global imperative unless now we ensure that all peoples, whoever they are, are treated as we would wish to be treated ourselves. The world is not going to be a viable place. So we launched this, and it was written as a de initially as a demonstration that uh, religious people could. Uh, get on with together. On this, we were all in agreement. It, the document itself is only 350 words, but it was a call to action. And people started coming out of the woodwork and uh, starting to use it. Now, uh, the trouble is, the compassion has that kind of soft kumbaya edge, you know? Um, and if I have a, a nightmare about the charter, it will be full of uh, little groups around the world forgiving themselves and having appreciation days when really <laughs> we've got our work cut out to create uh, better. Uh, now, one of my disappointments with the charter is this. We've started to create a network of cities of compassion uh, where you have to get the mayor endorses it and you have to get various businesses and edge colleges involved and behind it where you try and practically uh, introduce the golden rule. The best uh, example is Karachi, which I, I, is, is a source of great joy to me. Pakistan, we've been hearing this morning, right on the edge of uh, all the pro problems that are tearing our world apart. And they, this businessman who's had me over to Pakistan many times to speak, he's got behind it and he's created a network of schools of compassion. We were talking about schools this morning, which is introducing compassion into core subjects of the curriculum uh, to build, the, and there are now over a thousand of these schools. Um, and they, they've, the med, in, these children from these schools made the plea to the mayor and uh, they, they uh, asked for a, a city where there could be more uh, equality, because there's massive inequality, where they can go out without being blown up by a suicide bomb. And uh, so the, the Karachi is concentrating on education, business, and driving. Um, so we could all do with some more compassionate drivers. <laughs> um, now, now we've, there are 30, Louisville is, is doing tremendously well. I'm going there next month. Uh, a, a very dynamic mayor. Uh, but the, my dream was always to twin some of these cities. 
so that you get a city in, the middle, in here, uh, say the United States, twinned with a city in the Middle East so that you know, there could be news exchange. I can't get people to do this. They want their own city, their own community to be. The Muslims are keener on it, uh, but the mayor of Louisville, a businessman, said he doesn't see the return. Uh, I, I'm going there next, and we're, we're, we're trying to sort of... But a, a good story about the Louisville uh, was that uh, recently a mosque was vandalized, and the mayor uh, went on television and said this is not acceptable and asked for volunteers uh, to clean it up. And a thousand people showed up from, of all ages, ethnicities from all over the city. So th there are good things happening. But, um, I, 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 but there is this tendency to, I mean, one, uh, just, I'm supposed to be doing a video next week for, I'm not going to tell you the city's name, a, a very a distinguished city in Europe. And I suggested, you know, that perhaps they might like to twin with another city, you know, hope, ever hopeful. No, they said back, it came back a list of the things they wanted me to say. And it was all about their pain, how that compassion can help us deal with our sorrows. And I thought, get real, you know? I mean, we are living lives of such absolute privilege in our Western cities. Yes, we have our terrorist attacks, but look at the state of the world. And, uh, don't, you know, just look out. I see a little notice down there, yes. <laughs> uh, to, to, we need to break out of the confines of selfishness and reach out to, to the other. We're going to open this up to our colleagues, but before I do, let me ask you one last question. Um, you mentioned we've got some work to do in oh. front of us. We're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Berkeley mm. Center. Imagine we're back here together 10 years from now, focused on the achievements that have taken place over the course of the next year. How would you have us focus our work over the course of this next decade? I would, I would like there to be, number one, as Akbar was saying this morning, to bring it down from the high uh, grove of academe. And because people are hungry for this. Uh, all over the world, people are hungry for peace, and, uh, and young people particularly. Uh, but also this global outreach. I think uh, we uh, need to sort of start, I'd like, wouldn't it be great if Berkeley could join up with someone else in the Middle East or, uh, you know, Pakistan or uh, Africa? Uh, because uh, look at the migrants. This is, we haven't talked about them yet. Um, and this is, uh, and we, this is chickens coming home to roost. Uh, for, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, Europeans went over to these Middle Eastern countries and African countries and uh, exploited them for their own ends, uh, made the, these countries unlivable in, in many ways, and now they're coming, it was called the scramble for Africa, if you remember. Now we've got the scramble for Europe. And people are literally dying to get into Europe. We need now to, for, I think if Berkeley could spearhead the notion that we are now living, whether we like it or not, in a globalized world, where, as I said earlier, everyone is our brother because our histories are intertwined, our fates are intertwined, our economies are deeply intertwined. Politically, we're all utterly interdependent. We're linked together as never before on the World Wide Web. And now we have to uh, educate us, public, and ourselves as scholars uh, to reach out and make serious connections with others and so that we create a network uh, of goodwill to conquer some of the bad will that we are encountering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's open it up. I have a question. Question, 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 question. A question over here. The microphone will come right to you. Please introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Skip Kissinger. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your concept of, of kind of the state 
and economics and the war process. And I'm wondering, I mean, you talk about in the ancient kind of zero-sum game process, if you will, where you're out to conquer land and territory and, and, and get agricultural wealth. We now live in a world that is a bit more transformed by technology and by the possibilities of an economic gain that's a positive sum gain. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the positive transformations of a positive sum game in terms of economics and warfare. Don't ask me too much about economics. Um, I, I'm not very good on economics. Uh, but uh, technology, for example, is, 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 is a powerful tool. Uh, but um, it's also encouraging us to think a bit too quickly. Um, printing affected the way we uh, read our scriptures uh, in, in a not very good way. I uh, made us far more superficial. And, uh, and, and with these uh, sound bites, uh, I, 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 I see uh, the world becoming, that people can look into their phones and see how privileged we are from a, a, a position of great uh, poverty and distress. There's far too much inequity, it seems to me, in the world. Um, and um, and we go to, we've always gone to war for um, economy, the economic reasons. And I think this has not helped us in the Middle East either. Oil, for example. Uh, has made us, uh, has, has made this, that particular region a, a focus of greed. Uh, and we've sort of courted weird people, uh, or, or, or pe people to get cheap oil or to have oil allies. And uh, the results have been horrific, and so, some of them are coming again, hope to us to roost. Uh, I, 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 I'm very conscious of the mass massive inequity that, there, that still exists in countries like Pakistan, as, as Akbar was mentioning this morning, vast inequity. Uh, and there are people in the world who have no clean water, where children are dying because they're drinking polluted water. They're, that's all they have to drink. Um, and some of these uh, countries, the population has grown to such an extent that they, the country can't support them. That's one of the reasons why some of the migrants from Africa are trying to get to Europe. Um, and we live, again, these, with the lives of an aristocracy, I feel. I don't feel it's that much different. It's just on a, on a different scale. The inequity is still there. The suffering is still there. The pain is still there. Um, and there's now the added edge that with technology, they can see it. Um, they can just look into them and see the way we're living. And of course, they want going to get it. There's also going to be resentment. You know, just on, on this point, um, the relationship of technology and the practice of our faith and, um, and this, the, the transmission of sacred texts, oh. would you describe for, for our colleagues your current work and what you're... Yes, I'm just starting a new book about scripture because there's so much rubbish being talked about scripture at the moment, you know, the Quran and, uh, you know, Tony, this is what got me into it was Tony Blair's announcement recently uh, that uh, he has read the Quran and he now sees that there's a theological problem with Islam and he is going to sort it out. <laughs> um, you can laugh, but one of the reasons I'm leaving tonight uh, instead of staying on a couple of days, was because there was going to be a meeting in London with Shimon Peres, Clinton, and, and Tony, of course, to discuss this project quite seriously. Uh, it's been called off because uh, Shimon Peres has had a, heart, had a heart attack and his doctors advised against it. Um, and, but this is a, it's that kind of snap thing. I've read the Quran now. Nope, oh, we're all systems go. We can go and, and reform the whole thing. Now, um, so I've been looking at, at scripture a bit. I, well, I'm going to do a history of scripture worldwide in all traditions to see what these scriptures actually meant and how they were received. Uh, because uh, w nobody read their scriptures silently because most people couldn't read. 
Um, and most people listen to their scriptures. The Quran, it's called recitation. You listen to it. You don't just pick it up and pick out a couple of words of j on jihad and how you're all going. Uh, it's, um, it, you listen to it over time and, and it, 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 it's, it's a sonoral scripture. Similarly with the Chinese scriptures. The, J the Chinese had their printing reformation uh, bef revolution long before we did in the 12th century. And you get the Neo-Confucian saying, whoa, hey, this is not good. They're suddenly being in inundated with all these books and they're reading their scriptures quickly. And the, the scriptures should be internalized, memorized, sung, um, and, and it means something different. Um, I'm also going to call it the broken world of scripture because um, I think they reflect the human condition. The, it's the fact that scripture is a human activity. And um, if you look at, say, the book of Genesis, for example, um, it's a terrible story. And people often say, well, how could God possibly have asked Abraham to kill his own son? But this is our world in which fathers often sacrifice their children, not necessarily on an altar, but in all kinds of other ways. Uh, this is a world we recognize only too well, uh, where brother kills brother, uh, where uh, people dump their wives, not necessarily in a desert, but just dump them and their children. Um, and God can often appear cruel in the, our world with the flood. And no wonder, after when Noah gets out of the ark and sees this depopulated world, he gets drunk with horror of the whole thing that has happened. I heard that a Holocaust survivor had the same experience when he went back to his village and found it empty. Um, and the New Testament, we often sort of uh, make it, you know, you see Jesus with a lamb tucked under one arm and a child on his knee and it all looks so nice, but again, uh, Jesus, the way, especially the Gospel of St. Mark, is surrounded, inundated with suffering people, uh, screaming for help, with, with they're sick, they're beaten down by poverty, uh, they're, they're blind, they're, they're, they've got terrible diseases, and, and he, he, they press in claustrophobically on him, and then he is himself is hounded to an agonizing death. And the Quran, uh, the li early lives of the prophet were a, a commentary on the Quran. And it's a terrible story again of uh, persecution, uh, expulsion, uh, horror, uh, a massacre, terror. Um, and yet out of that comes the beauty of the Quran. And, it, and that out of, in, in Genesis, Abraham takes in three strangers uh, total strangers looks after them and has a theophany where Esau can look into the eyes of the brother who wronged him and see the face of God. And this is what we are. We have these moments of insight and beauty and yet our world is broken and scripture is a product of that and a, a way of dealing with this, this brokenness. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, microphone right over here. Hold it, it's coming, it's coming. Please introduce yourself. My name is Ilhan Kagri, and I'm from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And um, I have to bring up Donald Trump. And I was just wondering. Yeah, had to. <laughs> um, so uh, it, the, the question is this, that it, it would seem to me that you know a large number of Trump's followers would consider themselves Christians and might even call themselves good Christians. And yet, uh, Trump's rhetoric is often um, characterized with a lot of bullying and violence and bias and what I would consider very unchristian types of thoughts and ideas. And I'm just wondering how you could explain that. I mean, like, what's going wrong there? Well, um, uh, it, 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 that's not Christian behavior, let's put it, put it that way. Love your enemies, said Jesus. And that doesn't mean you're to be filled with soggy affection for them. Uh, but because the, 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 his comment, Jesus is commenting on Leviticus, where love your neighbor, and it's hesed, which means loyalty, and it 
was two kings would promise, it was used in international treaties, it was a legal term, two kings would promise to love each other, which didn't mean they fell into each other's arms, but they would look out for each other and give each other practical help. And um, this is uh, Trub. This, this, there's nothing Christian about this. So, uh, there's nothing Christian about hatred or uh, uh, chauvinism. Uh, or I, 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 but he is, uh, as we were saying earlier at lunch, I mean, this is the most wonderful opportunity for IS. When they, this will go out all over the world and they'll see um, people cheering, they'll see um, um, him saying that Muslims' uh, mosques have got to be sort of supervised and uh, Muslim districts patrolled. Um, uh, I, but you know, we talk about Christian, I, I often, I've often thought, I had the wicked thought of, I'd like to show Jesus around the Vatican, for example. <laughs> Um, and or take him to the Lambeth Conference in London, and I did this, you know. I mean, uh, but, but uh, you know, we we have these marvelous uh, founders, and we fail them always because hate is easier. Hate is about ego, uh, not losing the ego in letting the finding the freedom of letting the ego go and uh, honoring the other. I was once, I, in this city, I was invited by Imam Majid uh, to address a, uh, a caucus of very conservative congressmen. And one of them said, you know, I, I was talking about interfaith, etc. One of them said, look, ma'am, you know, Jesus did say, um, you know, no one comes to the Father but through me. Um, I thought, thank you, Ima Majid, for this. But uh, anyway, the, the, this text, I tried a little biblical criticism on them. Uh, that went down like a lead balloon. Uh, but then I said, look at the gospel story. This is a man who's continually annoying the authorities. He's continually touching people who are ritually unclean. He is continually going out and having dinner with the wrong people, people who are shunned as sinners, uh, endlessly leaping over boundaries. Now, do you th think now that Jesus, if he came back today with all the knowledge we have about the richness and profundity of the world's religious traditions, he would sit there saying, sorry, no one comes to the Father but through me. I said, I don't see it. Um, and uh, that's what the, uh, Jesus was a a, break, a a breaker of boundaries. But also, one of the things too about broken world of scripture, uh, the Prophet Muhammad found it very difficult to utter the Quran. Uh, there was uh, he was he, he he would sweat even on a cold day. He'd faint. Uh, trying to get this out. It was very painful. It was almost as being, he said once, I never received a revelation without feeling that my soul was being torn away from me. And it's a motif in the Bible too. Moses has a speech impediment and his brother Aaron has to speak for him. Isaiah's lips have to be cleansed with a burning coal before he can utter the word of God. Ezekiel is made to swallow a scroll. And uh, Muhammad, and Jesus, the word of God in Christianity, is hounded to death, an agonizing death. And it should give people pause when they say they're speaking in the name of God today with such facility, to see that in our broken world, it is very, very difficult, our broken, violent world, very difficult to speak the word of God. And I think we should be much more reticent in claiming that we do. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, John Garrity, uh, when I read about the destruction of the ruins in the Middle East, I wonder about the political significance. Those ruins have been under the control of Muslim authorities for a thousand years or more. Mm. Why in 2015 do you blow them up? Oh, well, this is uh, something that uh, is... Um, uh, annoying me is that the Saudis have been doing this in Mecca for uh, a long time. 
because they don't approve of shrines and had been dr destroying these shrines associated with the prophet and his companions. Um, and uh, in, in this terrible iconoclasm, I think it just, it, it's, it's certainly nothing in Islam uh, about, about this, as you quite rightly point out, those ruins, uh, Palmyra has been under Muslim control for centuries um, and, and honored. Uh, but the Taliban too did the same with the Buddhas in, in, in and it's, it shows, I think, the, and, but the, our Puritans did the same. I'm a trustee of the British Museum and we have a very poor uh, medieval collection because at the Reformation, the good Protestants bashed down all these statues. Um, and I th it's, it's, um, it's a t it shows the kind of the nihilism and the barrenness uh, and a profound, I think, fear of anything, fear and l visceral loathing of anything that had gone before, that, was, that seems, uh, uh, I don't know, precious. Uh, and it is, uh, it, 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 it's a tragedy. Uh, in the British Museum, we're training now people, to, uh, we've put, got a huge uh, million dollar grant uh, to uh, start training people in the Middle East when it's finally over, to start, because archeologists are used to dealing with rubble and to see how they can put these things together again. But it is an example of, 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 of the nihilism uh, and, and of certain strains of Islam that have come in that find other, especially from Saudi Arabia, that have found these uh, other previous traditions difficult to, uh, difficult even to contemplate. Thank you for your presence here as part of this 10th anniversary celebration of the Berkeley Center. It means a great deal to us to have you a part of it. And ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in expressing our gratitude to Karen Armstrong? And thank you. Thank you so much.